لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود قبله في الكون من بعده السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We continue from where we left off last day and we were discussing um, verse 48 and in verse 48 Allah made mention of three prophets and he had asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to remember Prophet Ismail Alayhi Salam, Prophet Al Yasa'a and also Prophet Zul Kifal and we mention obviously uh, much has been said about Prophet Ismail Alayhi Salam already and uh, we mention about Prophet Al Yasa'a, Prophet Yasa'a, who is known as Prophet Elisha. And we were on the topic of Zul Kifal. And Prophet Zul Kifal, Zul Kifal was uh, the person we were speaking about, who, about whom some of the great commentators of the Holy Quran have mentioned that he was a pious man and a righteous man, and he was not a prophet. And that was one opinion that was held. And it is about trying to figure out and find out who was uh, this person by the name of Dhul Kifal. You know, Hafiz Ibn Kathir has given a little bit of detailed explanation regarding him. And he lived at the time of Prophet Elisha, that is Prophet Al Yasa'a. And Prophet Yasa'a, we have seen so far when he, he was a prophet and he was uh, fulfilling the commitment of conveying the message to the people. On one occasion, he mentioned his desire and wish that he said that I wish I could have them. There could be someone who I could appoint to carry out this job and task that I'm doing. And we remember that one person got up and said that I will do that. And then he, at the same time, while mentioned that, mentioned that Prophet uh, Al Yasa'a said that the person must be able to fulfill three conditions. He must perform salat every night for the whole night he must fast during the daytime and he must never become angry and uh, he when prophet this person will kifal will raise his hand and said that i will do it he just uh, you know close the majlis the gathering and then the next day he asked the same question and the same person came up and eventually he he appointed zul kifal to be his successor who will take over from him. And uh, about that, it was mentioned where Satan wanted to test Zul Kifal to make him not be able to fulfill these promises. Obviously, with respect to Salah, that was in order for the entire night, waking out by night in Salah, fasting during the day. But that point about becoming angry this is where Satan himself made that plot to make him angry. And uh, we know that the only sleep that Zul Kifl used to get was the siesta. That's after lunch, after Zuhr Salat, um, that small nap, afternoon nap. Because for the entire night he will be performing Salat. During the day he has his, uh, you know, chores to attend to. And besides that he used to decide the cases of people do the work as a prophet. So that was the only time. And if he missed that time, then he would not be able to get it for the rest of the day. And for the entire night, he will not be able to get any rest. So it was mentioned when um, he, the person came, Satan came in the form of a poor old man and laid his case, you know, and he wanted Zul Kifil to, to hear the case. And Zul Kifil mentioned to him that, come to my court, you know, and I will deal with the keys. So it continues from there. And when he said, it states, then he went to his court and looked around for that old man, but he could not find him. That the old man was actually Satan, who disguised himself as a poor old person in order to get to Zul Kifal so he may break that you know promise that he made that he will never become angry the next day in the morning when he was judging between people's matter 
he also waited for him. But he did not turn up. That's the old man. However, when it was time for siesta, and he went home and was about to sleep, the man turned up and knocked on the door. When he asked, who is at the door, the man replied, the old man who has been wronged. He opened the door for him and said, did I not tell you that when I sit in my court, you should come to me? The old man replied, my people are the worst of people. When they knew that you are sitting in the court, they said to me, we will give you your right. But when you left your court, they started again, resisting to give me my right. He said, you go now, that is Zulkifal said to him, you go away now and when I am in my court, you come to me. So he ended that day and was expecting the old man to come the next day. So that day he was unable to have his siesta. So it was the time when he was going to take his sleep that that was the time the old man came, disturbed him. He disturbed him. So that entire period where he could have taken his nap, it went while speaking to the old man. So that they went like that also. The second day he did not get any nap. So that day he was unable to have his siesta. He went to his court and waited for that old man, but he did not turn up again. The old man did not, because it was a trick that Satan was using. He felt drowsy and slumberous. So he said to one of his household, that is when he came back home, do not let anyone come to this door so I could have some sleep because my eyes are heavy with sleep. So this is the order he gave to the doorkeeper and those people of the household. However, the old man appeared again at his usual time. He will come exactly at that time when Dhul will take his nap. The one who was watching the door said to him, go back, go back. The old man said, I had come to him yesterday and mentioned to him my need. But the man at the door replied that he, was command, that he has commanded us to not to let anyone enter the door. So we are not going to let you in. Whatever he had to do, you know, he had to do it. That was he will not let anybody come in. So when he, that's the old man, felt disappointed and he realized that he was not going to get through there, the person would not open the door for him, he climbed up the wall and got inside the house. Then he knocked at the door from inside because he was already inside. But he wanted to grab the attention of Zulkifal, so he knocked the inside of the door. And the man woke up, that was Zulkifal. He said to the man at the door, Oh God, that Zulkifal got up and he went to the, uh, that is the God. Now, oh God, did I not tell you not to let anyone in the house? The man replied, he did not enter the house from my side. He didn't pass here. I didn't allow him to enter here. Ask him from where did he enter? The man stood up to check the door, which he found closed. The old man was inside. So he knew who he was. He asked him, are you the enemy of Allah? Referring to Shaitan. Are you the enemy of Allah? The old man replied, yes. I am that person. You failed me in everything. Everything I did to test you, to put you to a severe trial, you failed me. You did not allow me to pass that. So I could not get through to you. So I did what I did to make you angry. And so Allah called him Dhul Kifl because he took the responsibility of doing something and he fulfilled it. This, is what, this was not his real name. Dhul Kifl, as I explained last day. Kifl in Arabic, it comes from the word kafala. Kafala means a guarantee, an assurance. So a kafil in Arabic is called a guarantor. You, you stand guarantee for another person. So it means responsibility. So because he took the responsibility to fulfill these three conditions which he had mentioned to Prophet al yasaa he kept it. So he was called Zul Kifal. Other traditions also state that he, you know, uh, he took, stood the responsibility for some people, some poor people who used to use all their time in the obedience of Allah. Because he was from the Israelite, he was an Israelite prophet. And some people from among the Israelites, they had 
taken it upon themselves to worship Allah night and day. So they were fully absorbed in Allah's ibadat. And among the Israelites, there were many people like that who used to devote their entire lives in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, they could not work during the day to earn a livelihood. So Dhul Kifal was the one who took the responsibility for them by telling them, you go ahead and worship Allah night and day. I will work and I will look after you all. And from that day, he was called Dhul Kifal, the man who took up a responsibility for other people. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala and the great Sahabi and companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while standing on the member, the pulpit, he once said, Dhul Kifal was not a prophet, but there was a pious man who prayed every day 100 prayers, 100 rakats. Then after that pious man died, he, Dhul Kifal, took up as his duty to pray 100 prayers every day. Hence, hence he was called Dhul Kifal. So this is where a prophet al yasaa prophet Elisha, when he was a prophet, he used to do this. During the day he will perform salat and during the night he will uh, he perform salat and during the day he will perform salat and observe the fast. And uh, he also never got angry with every, anybody. So when he was deputing somebody to take over his task, uh, he laid those conditions upon the person. So when al yasa passed away, Dhul Kifal took the responsibility to do the same thing. So in that way, he was called Dhul Kifal as uh, mentioned by the famous companion Abu Musa Ash'ari. Hafiz ibn Kathir has mentioned this in his Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya. So as it is mentioned, getting back to the point, while some scholars held the opinion that, that Dhul Kifal was only a pious man and not a prophet, the more popular and accepted opinion is that he was a prophet of Allah. So there is a difference of opinion, but the popular opinion, the mashur opinion, and that which is well known, is that he was a prophet of Allah. The reason for this is that in the Holy Quran, Allah has mentioned him in the list of prophets. Whenever Allah mentions to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and remember so and so, the prophets, Dhul Kifl name will come between those names. His name will come between those names. So it is unlike any other pious man that was spoken about in the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about many pious people from the past. But his name was always, whenever mentioned in the Quran, it was mentioned along with the list of the Anbiyas and the Prophets. So this is why that is a very, very clear and glaring evidence and proof that he was counted from among the Prophets. In this respect, Hafiz ibn Kathir writes, it seems obvious as he is mentioned in the Quran alongside these prophets that he was also a prophet. May Allah send peace upon all of them. And this is the popular opinion and the opinion that is generally accepted, although you have the individual opinions. Having mentioned about these prophets, Allah says, all are among the best, subhanAllah, all of them. It means that they were from among the best servants whom Allah had chosen. Hence, he, the Prophet wasallam, should adopt the way which they adopted in exercise, exercise and patience in the path of Allah. So the Prophet wasallam has been told that they were from among the best. In other words, if you have to follow anyone, then look at their example and look at their conduct and follow them because they were from among the best. Surah Saad goes further in verse 49 and states, this is a reminder after mentioning about the prophets, first of all, Ibrahim alayhi salam along with other prophets, Yaqub, Ishaq alayhi salatu was salam, and then these other prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, this is a reminder. This is a reminder. And verily for the muttaqun, that's the pious and righteous persons, is a good final return, a good final return. The first thing that is mentioned here, Allah says after mentioning about these prophets, Allah says this is a reminder. And even before mentioning about the first of the six prophets, that is, we had Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ishaq, Yaqub, we had those three, and then 
Allah told the Prophet, and remember Ismail, and Yasa'a, and Dhulkifal also. But before that, before that, we had quite a lot of information about Prophet Dawood alayhi salam. Allah went in details with him. And also Prophet Suleiman alayhi salam. And also there were a lot of details about him. So after mentioning all these things, now Allah reaches to this point where he says, this is a reminder. This is a reminder. The question is, what is the reminder? What is Allah referring to when he says, this is the reminder? And the scholars have, uh, you know, given different opinions about what Allah refers to when he mentions the word this. In this verse, as it is mentioned here, Allah mentions that this is a reminder, which is in the ayah. According to many commentators, the reminder here refers to the mentioning of several prophets in the above verses. The verse therefore means that the mentioning of these prophets is indeed a wonderful advice and reminder for all those who wish to take an advice. Why? Because of the fact that the lives of the prophets that have been placed in the Quran, it there are many lessons to be learned from what happened to them, how they reacted to situations, how they lived their lives, the tests and trials Allah sent over them, how they were patient, how they were forbearing, how they were abid, they were worshippers of Allah. So therefore Allah is saying that the mention of these prophets in the Holy Quran itself is an advice to everybody who recites the Quran and believes. So a person can look at the life of Suleiman and Dawood and Ibrahim and get a reminder from it, get lessons from it. It is also a reminder of these noble prophets of the past so that people may know and recognize them. So one is that in the mentioning of these prophets, there is a reminder to everybody. Every single believer can learn and will learn and must learn lessons from their lives. In that way, it is a reminder. The other is that by mentioning these prophets in the Holy Quran, those who will come after will now come to know about those prophets. So it's reminding the people that such and such prophets came in history. Because if the Quran was not revealed as the final book, then the truth will not be distinguished from the falsehood. And as to which prophets a person should believe in, and who are those people who are not prophets and they were called prophets? There will be no what? Nothing, no measurement, no yardstick, no criterion to determine that. And this is why the Holy Quran has been called a what? A furqan. It is the criterion between haqq and batil. So whatever wrong messages were propagated by the people in the past, the Quran placed that and set it right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it very clear what these people are saying is wrong. What they say about Prophet Suleiman is wrong. What they say about Prophet Dawood is wrong. What they say about Adam is wrong. Subhanallah. Because many of them do not believe Adam was a Nabi. But Allah says he was a Nabi. He was indeed a Nabi of Allah, a Prophet of Allah. And all the wrong things. So through the Quran, now we, those who are the followers of the final prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now we have come to know about such great prophets who visited the face of the earth and also to know and get accurate information about their lives and what they did and they were holy men and they were people whom Allah had blessed in this life. And the things that were fabricated about them the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his traditions and Allah even before that in the Quran indicated to those things. So we as Muslims and every single person, even though that person might not be a Muslim, the Quran stands as a book of guidance for those who want to know what is right. For those who want to know what is right. This is why certain incidents which were actually um, interfered with by the Ahlul Kitab, Allah revealed the entire history from beginning to end. And some prophets, uh, they did that with, was Musa alayhi salam. One, this is why you'll find the incident of Musa alayhi salam at length in the Quran. They did that with Isa alayhi salam and his beloved mother, Maryam alayhi salam. And Allah mentioned their incident at length. 
They did that with Yahya alayhi salam and Zakaria alayhi salam. Allah mentioned that also. And they did that with Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, Jacob. This is why Surah Yusuf was revealed and the entire history of Yusuf alayhi salam was given. So it corrected those things also. So those coming after will know in an accurate manner what really happened and what did not happen. What happened and what did not happen. And in this way, many, many incidents, you know, were mentioned in the Holy Quran, even incidents that were not connected to prophets. Allah cleared that up. For example, the sleepers of the cave, where they fabricated many things regarding the, the sleepers of the cave. You know, the incident about Bilqis, you know, during the time of uh, Suleiman alayhi salam. Then we also had the incident of the city of Saba, which we have dealt with already in Surah Saba. And quite a number of incidents. And there is a famous incident in Surah Baqarah. And because of that incident, the name of the Surah has been named, named Baqarah. Baqarah means cow or heifer. And because of the fact that an incident occurred among the Israelites regarding that, Allah revealed Subhanallah, it's the longest surah of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, and named it after that incident, Al-Baqarah, because of that. So therefore, this is second point, this is the second reason why it is called a reminder. So it reminds the believers, it reminds those people who will come at the end following the final prophet about those prophets that came in the beginning, who they were, their status and rank in the sight of Allah, and the true teachings that were given by these prophets. In this way, the mention of these prophets in the Holy Quran establishes a noble rank and status for them. For they shall always be remembered by everyone who recites the Holy Quran until the day of judgment, subhanAllah. And what a beautiful thing that we have learned in our deen that these prophets, there, there were many more prophets than that, than those who have men, been mentioned in the Quran. But subhanAllah, Allah Himself in many, many ayats of the Quran, after speaking about a prophet, you know, we read those ayats already. Salamun ala Ilyasin. And peace be upon Ilyas. And peace be upon Ibrahim. And from that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever you send peace and greetings upon me, send it also upon the prophets because Allah has ordered that we do that also. So, <clears throat> whenever we mention the name of any prophet, we say, alayhi salatu was salam, may the blessings, may greetings be upon them also. You know that it's a dua for them. So, besides making dua and sending peace and salutations upon our prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then, we are also have been instructed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to send greetings to them also, which Muslims do, Alhamdulillah. Other scholars like Suddi, one of the great commentators of the Holy Quran from the very early centuries, have explained that the statement of Allah which states, this is a reminder, he says this refers to the Holy Quran. Obviously, uh, this phrase has been mentioned quite a number of times in the Holy Quran, referring to the Holy Quran, where Allah says, Hadihi tazkira, this is a reminder, this is an advice, and it immediately refers back to the Holy Quran. So this is an opinion that has been given. Most of the commentators, however, have adopted the first opinion, because this statement, this is a reminder, was mentioned immediately after the mentioning of all these prophets. So when you use the word this, hadha, and hadihi or dhalika, it's ismush ishara. Yani, it is the announce that indicate towards, you know, um, you are making a sign and indication towards something. Ishara, you are given an indication towards something. And when you say this, it always goes back to its closest, the noun that has been mentioned with it before. Okay? That which has been indicated towards that which is the closest to it, it, it refers to that. So, therefore, if I am speaking about something, and, and when we are speaking about that topic and then I say this, you will want to think, well, what is the this? The this will only refer to back to what the topic of discussion. So therefore, Allah has mentioned all these prophets, one after the other, and then Allah says this. So what the this will refer to? 
You know, it will refer to that which is the topic of discussion and that which has been mentioned about and that which the mention is being made about at that time. So this is why um, the general body of the commentators of the Holy Quran have stated that is the best opinion which has been mentioned before. That when Allah says this is a reminder, meaning the, what, the mentioning of these prophets in the Holy Quran one after the other, it is an advice, it is a reminder. So this from among those commentators, not many of the commentators, probably he is alone who has adopted his opinion, but a very great commentator, Mufassir of the Holy Quran, a Suddi, he says it refers to the Holy Quran, the message of the verse, therefore, according to this tafsir and commentary by a Suddi, is that Allah states that the Quran which has been revealed by Allah, that the Quran which has been revealed by Allah is an advice and reminder to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Ummah, his nation. Through the Quran, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been reminded and the Ummah of Muslims have also been reminded as it is mentioned in Tafsir At-Tabari by Ibn Jarir At-Tabari. So we have those two opinions and both are in its place and the ayah can and the ayah refers to both also because when Allah says this is an advice, we know the Quran is the greatest advice. And we also know that in the lives of the Prophet, there are reminders for us also. So both fall in place. We learn many different things. This is why uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself was asked to remember those Prophets so he may follow their examples. Having mentioned that the Quran is an advice and a reminder, the above verse mentions at the end, and verily for the pious and righteous, that's in the same verse, and verily for the pious and righteous person is a good and beautiful return. It's a good and beautiful return. And uh, what, what has been mentioned there is verily for the pious and righteous person. Now, if you look at the ayah, you will say where Allah says, this is a reminder and verily for the muttaqun. And the muttaqun means what? Those who have taqwa. Muttaqin, muttaqun, those who have taqwa. And Allah says, for the muttaqin, for the muttaqin, Allah says, they have a good final return. So the topic here, the people who are being spoken about here, it is not al-mu'mineen and al-mu'minun. That's general. Believers, they are general. Those who believe in Allah. Now every muttaqi has to be a believer. You can't be a muttaqi except that you are a believer. Because the first step is to believe in Allah. The first step is to believe in Allah. But when everybody and people are mu'mineen and they are believers, then you have believers who would have less good deeds and more wrong deeds. They are also believers. You can't call them unbelievers. They are believers who would have an equal amount. They are believers because of the actions deserved. They deserve the punishment of Allah. They are involved in wrong deeds. There will be believers who have a little more good than the bad that they have. And then there are those who strive every day to ensure that they don't have any of those sins. And they try to gain close, closeness to Allah. And they try to always be obedient to Allah in everything and stay away from every sin. There are different levels of taqwa. Okay? And Allah makes that promise here that certainly... For the muttaqin, they have the best final return. For the muttaqin, they have the best final return. When they die, the return, subhanallah, will be the best. It will be the best for them. But that promise is for the muttaqin. One level of taqwa, obviously, the first level is that a person shuns shirk and kufr and he accepts iman. The first level. But after being a believer now, now a person is required to follow the Sharia and follow the deen of Islam. After he has accepted Islam, now it is up. He must do that. He must do that. Now in doing that, he may be disobedient to Allah. So he is a Muslim, but he does not perform salat. He is a Muslim, probably he does not fast. So he does not have taqwa. He doesn't fear Allah. He openly and boldly disobeys Allah. He has no taqwa in him now. 
He is not fearful, but he is fearless. He is not afraid of Allah's azab in this world or the hereafter. So that's not a muttaqi. You know, and what, what a person can do, obey and disobey, obey and disobey, and continue his life like that. Many Muslims, I mean, we are all weak. You do, a good, you do good deeds and then you come and you do bad deeds and then you do good deeds again and then you, we do something and we make tawbah to Allah and after making a promise to Allah, we go back, people go back. You know, this is why beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, Kullu bani Adam Every son of Adam commits sins. We are not human beings, are not angels. The Muslims are not angels also. It happens intentionally or unintentionally. Things may happen you didn't intend, but it happened. So he says, every son of Adam, he commits sins, you know. He says, وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ tawabuna." But the best of all those who commit sins are those who repent to Allah frequently. So he admits the fact by saying, well, I am weak, I'm only human, it can happen. But you know what? I am constantly begging for your forgiveness. And I'm repenting to you that I will not do it again. It happens again and Allah will turn to him again once the person is sincere. So, taqwa, the levels of taqwa, they are different because people fear Allah to a different level. A person may only refrain from major sins but may do minor sins. And many different things will happen. But in reality, taqwa, it is, taqwa, it is to do what? To fulfill the commandments of Allah and to refrain from the ma'asi and the sins that Allah has considered to be sins and Allah has written as sins. So those who have taqwa and those who are considered to be God-fearing people, they have taqwa, they are called muttaqun, pious people. It may not, piety does not really mean that the only pious people are people who may wake for a lot of times during the night and then fast regularly. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that a person has to actually be performing tahajjud salat every night to be a muttaqi in the sight of Allah. No, it doesn't mean that. But a person who is conscious of the fact that Allah looks at him every time and everything he says, he's conscious that he doesn't say the wrong thing. He does not look at the wrong thing. He does not listen to the wrong thing. He's careful of what enters into his heart, that he does not entertain ill thoughts and evil thoughts. He is conscious of his thing. On one hand, he is fulfilling what Allah has made compulsory upon him, and at the same time, he is staying away from the haram. From the haram, then, subhanallah, in the sight of Allah, he is a muttaqi person. He is a muttaqi person. A person, we know the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala and whom were very great. Nobody coming after them can reach their status. But Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, and you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam custom was that he will perform his witr salat after tahajjud. And he will recommend and instruct everybody to do that. Some Sahabas could do it. And he, Abu Huraira used to do his witr after Isha before he went to sleep. Why? Because some of them used to work so hard during the day. You know, working in the fields, the date palms in Medina, night and day you are behind that you become so tired that you perform your salat and you go to sleep and you get up for fajr. But who can be better than the sahabas with taqwa and piety? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He looks at the individual and what the individual is doing of goodness. Yeah, and sometimes this is one of the things that come in our mind when we hear about piety and taqwa. You know, sometimes we as Muslims build this thing in our, our mind that you have to be doing so much and so much and, you know, I mean, wake the nights and get up for one third and then and only then you will be considered to be, you know, falling into the rank of the muttaqin. No, it doesn't like that. It, ha it doesn't happen like that. During the time of Imam Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, who was one of the great students of Imam Abu Hanifa. We are speaking about the first, second century Islam. The time of the Tabi, the children of the Sahabas. 
So he was a very, very great scholar, very great muhaddith, very great faqih and jurist, and very great mujtahid. There was a person, other, other, other great scholars at that time also. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa and the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, they were experts in fiqh. But fiqh, the, the subject of fiqh comes from the Quran and the Sunnah. It can't come from anywhere else. Fiqh has to come from the Quran and the Sunnah. This is what, these are the sources of fiqh. But they were experts in the field of fiqh. So many books that they have written has been on fiqh. You know, fiqh, um, Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence, interpretation of Islamic law. So once a great muhaddis said to him, he said, but you all have not written a book on, on zuhd, asceticism. A book, you know, a, a zuhd means trying to get closer and closer to Allah. You know. Trying to what? Achieve closeness to Allah. So you know you have many books speaking about a lot of fadail and a'mal. If you do this, you will get so much blessings. And if you do that, you will get so much blessings. And if you do this at this time in the morning or in the evening, then you will reach closer to Allah and all these things. So remember, Islamic law is not about fadail, not about virtues. It's about the law itself. It's about the sharia. So they said to him that you people have not written any book about zuhd. You know, so he says yes, but he says, no, you haven't written anything about that. He says, which book have you written? Imam Muhammad said, Sannaftu Kitab Al-Halal Wal-Haram. He says, I wrote, wrote the book that is called Al-Halal and Haram, and there can't be any greater zuhud and piety than doing what Allah has made halal and staying away from everything that Allah has made haram. That is true zuhud and taqwa. That's true zuhud and taqwa and piety. That whatever Allah has made haram, you stay away from it. What Allah has deemed to be halal, do that, use that, behave like that. It should not happen that while a person is trying to build himself, he is still doing haram things. So by doing the haram, it's actually, do you know what? Destroying the good deeds that you would have done early, early in the morning, early o'clock, you have done something haram and it has destroyed everything. So anyhow, the topic is about muttaqin here and Allah is speaking about them. And Allah says that they have a beautiful return, a very good return. It means that for every person who feared Allah by obeying his commands and he feared Allah by refraining from sins, so fear of Allah must come about in two ways. On one hand, it is not just doing good deeds, but the fear of Allah requires a person to also stay away from ban, stay away from sins. So a person should not only be building his good deeds, and he forgets the fact that he has to abstain from certain things also. And it does not happen that a person thinks to himself, I must only stay away from haram, but at the same time, he is not building his good deeds. Both things must be done. Obedience to Allah's commands, and at the same time, refraining from all those things that are haram. That is true taqwa and piety. And, who those, and that person who was obedient to the messenger of Allah and all the other messengers, there will be, Allah says, there will be a beautiful place of return in the hereafter for them. Where they will return to, what place they will return to, it will be the best. It will be a good place. With respect to the beautiful and good return that Allah has mentioned, which the pious persons will achieve in the hereafter, Allah mentions this in verse 50 of Surah Sad and states, Adan, Jannah to Adanin. The word comes in Arabic, Adn. Ad, Adn paradise means Jannah to Adn, Adn paradise. In brackets, it means everlasting gardens because the word Adn, one of the translation of the word Adn, it means that which lasts forever and that which lasts for a very long time. Whose doors will be open for them. This is that beautiful return because Allah says, certainly, for the pious and the righteous ones, they will have the best return, best place of return. 
Wherever they are going to go back to after having lived this life on the face of the earth, Allah says, where they are returning to, they will have the best. Subhanallah. What is that place? Allah says, Jannatu Adan. That place of return will be the paradise called Adan or the everlasting gardens. And a sifat of that is that the doors will be wide open for them to honor them, to welcome them. The verse explains that the pious ones will have paradise of Adan, which refers to eternal gardens. That's paradise. These will be ever everlasting and will never end. This is why it's called Jannatu Adan. It will never come to an end. It will never come to an end. The verse also mentions that the doors of paradise will be open for them. These doors will be opened for the believers by the command of Allah. Allah will order the doors and they will be opened directly or through the angels. Those going to paradise will not open them with their hands, nor will they request the doors to be opened. So those who are actually fixed and ordered to go to paradise, when they reach to the doors of paradise, the doors will open for them. They would not go and ask Allah and plead to Allah to open, nor will they take their hands to open the doors. And that is a treatment to special people. And that is an honor itself, that doors are opening for you. You don't have to ask to enter, you don't have to ask to be open, or you don't have to take your hands to open it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in honoring them with paradise, will have the doors open for them. As a special honor to them, the doors will be open to welcome them. This has also been highlighted in Surah Zumar, in which Allah says, those who fear their Lord will be led to paradise in groups. Those who feared Allah will be led to paradise in groups until when they arrive, its gates shall be open. SubhanAllah, on its own, the gates will just be wide open. Huge, big doors, as mentioned in Surah Zumar. While commenting on this, Imam Ar-Razi, Imam Fakhruddin Ar-Razi says, When the angels who have been deputed over paradise see the believers, they will immediately open the doors and greet them with salam and peace. Salamun alaykum, peace be unto you. In this way, the believers will enter paradise surrounded by the angels with great honor and dignity. So the angels will accompany them on both sides, subhanAllah, and the angels will be walking. And then in Jannah, there are angels who have been fixed for different duties and services for the believers. And when they see, as soon as they see the believers will be coming, they will open the doors for them as a welcome to them. Subhanallah. This is an honor that will be given to those who are pious and righteous, those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With respect to the paradise of Aden, which has been mentioned in verse 50, the first words, Jannah to Aden, paradise of Aden. Which is mentioned in the verse, the commentators of the Holy Quran have explained that the word Aden, it means permanent and everlasting. Hence, with this meaning, the verse explains that the believers will have a permanent and everlasting paradise in the hereafter. So that's the straightforward translation. So if Aden means permanent and everlasting, Jannah to Aden will mean gardens in paradise which will be everlasting and it will never come to an end. However, there is another commentary. The commentators have also explained that the word Aden is the name of a place in paradise that we often hear what? Sometimes you will see the translation there, Eden, the Garden of Eden. Obviously it's close to the word Aden. Whatever, wherever, you know, whether it is so or not, Allah alone knows the Garden of Eden and Jannah to Aden. But it is the name, according to these commentators, which also has been accepted, it is the name because there are seven different stories in Jannah, each has a different name. The Prophet ﷺ says, the best. And the highest is Jannatul Firdaus. There is Jannatul Ma'wa also. There is Jannatul Na'im. The highest Jannah, he says, so when you make dua to Allah for Jannah, ask for Jannatul Firdaus. It is the highest and the best Jannah. So Jannah to Adn, they have mentioned Jannah to Adn as being one. 
Regarding this, Hafiz ibn Kathir alayhi rahmah has narrated a tradition in which Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala stated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, in paradise there is a castle which is called the Adan. Pusur, a Qasran, a castle which is called Adan. Around it, there are towers and meadows, subhanallah. Lofty towers around it, meadows, like pastures right around it, subhanallah. This castle of Adan has 5,000 doors, subhanallah. Five, Allahu Akbar. And at each door, there are 5,000 silken wraps or shawls, like how probably how curtains will be or drapes will be hanging. There will be 5,000, you know, at these doors. No one will enter it and live in it except a prophet, a truthful person, a martyr, or a just imam and a just ruler or leader, as recorded by Tafsir ibn Kathir. Imam Qurtubi has also recorded the above narration in his tafsir, but has mentioned it as a statement of Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala, not a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But given the hawala and the reference one of the greatest mufassir of the Quran, Ibn Abi Hatim, Hafiz ibn Kathir has mentioned directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So sometimes a sahabi, you know, without mentioning the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will give the commentary because he knows he heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there is no reason for him to quote the authority because he knows it's the truth. It's the truth. You know, he knows it is the truth. So he doesn't say that the call of Rasulullah. He tells you this is the commentary of it because he knows he heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it is that it could directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Although in the tafsir of Imam Qurtubi, it stops at Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu ta'ala. Hafiz ibn Jarir al-Tabari has also mentioned an explanation of the Jannah, the paradise, which is known as Adan, Jannah to Adan, and stated that Qatada, one of the great mufassir of the Holy Quran and Tabi scholars, alayhi rahmah, while commenting on the paradise of Adan, Jannah to Adan, mentioned that once Umar radiallahu ta'ala asked Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala about Adan, he says, Mal Adan, he says, oh, Kaab, Kaab was a Sahabi also, a great scholar. He says, what is Adan? Adan mentioned in the Quran, what is that? He replied, O Amirul Mu'mineen, O commander of the faithful, Jannah to Adan, the paradise of Adan, they are castles in Jannah, which are made from gold. The prophets, the truthful ones, martyrs, and just imams and leaders shall live in these. Which means that it's basically the same thing. He did not go into details to mention about the 5,000 doors and the 5,000 silken shawls and wraps at each door. But he mentioned basically the same thing that Adan, there are castles in paradise. Different castles that people will be given, special people will be given. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking this into consideration, Allahu Akbar. Allah says, certainly for the God-fearing people, they will get Jannah to Adan. They will get those special castles and palaces known as Adan. With the towers around it and the meadows around it. In other words, they will get beautiful castles in paradise. As against, you know, houses just made with gold and silver, etc. But Allah has prepared because the more an individual does to please Allah and to build his deen and to actually increase his good deeds, it's only fair he gets more in return. So this is why the believers will get paradise, inshallah, yes, they will get. But what will the muttaqoon from the believers get? That's something that must be asked. Because if people are doing more than others, it's only fair that those who do more will get more. The martyrs will get even more. The siddiqin will get more. And the ambiyas will get the most, subhanallah. And from among the ambiyas, the rasul will get the most. And from among the rasul, those who were closest and most beloved to Allah will get the highest. So it moves like that. So therefore, yes, all believers will get. But Allah says, for the muttaqun, they will get Jannah to Adan. And more than that, what they will get? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes some of the comforts and pleasures in paradise where he says therein they will recline recline muttaki'ina fiha they will recline like how people sit on their couches on their sofa set they will be sitting on elevated chairs and they will have thrones the believers will have thrones like what even obviously better than what kings of this world would have but they will have thrones and they will recline Therein they will call for fruits in abundance and drinks. Subhanallah. The verse explains that in paradise, the God-fearing ones will recline on elevated chairs and thrones. They will be in great delight and happiness. The, the ayah says they will call for fruits in abundance and drinks because they will be offered these things. And they will be asked, what it is do you want? And in the hadith it is mentioned, Subhanallah. That some of them, because of the fact that if you go to a new place, if you go to a new place, even in this world, and you do not know what is being served, and you do not know what is, you have there, and somebody asks what you would like to have, you will remain silent because you don't know what to ask for. And worse yet, if you are seeing many things, but you don't know them, you don't know what's the name of this fruit, you don't know how it tastes. It's like you go to a foreign country and you see a lot of fruits. You will pick what you know about. This is why as a great ni'mat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran Surah Baqarah that the fruits in Jannah will resemble the fruits of this world. What is the hikmah for that? The hikmah and the wisdom is what I'm speaking, what I'm mentioning. Naturally, any human being behaves like that. What you don't know, you don't want to partake of. Because you are doubtful. Okay, you don't know about this, somebody is giving you, take, you say, but I don't know about that, I wouldn't take what I don't know about. So Allah will make those fruits resemble. So when you see something, you say, oh, look, this is it. But when you taste it, it will be, subhanAllah, a thousand times better in taste and quality in every single thing. So, so too, because of the fact that they would not know and they will not ask, and Allah will say, what do you want? You know, the angels will be passing they would be because the angels will work. They will actually be taking orders and passing around them to give them things. Then Allah will remind them and say, ask for this, ask for this, ask for this. Then they will know what to ask and they will ask for. So Allah says that they will be reclining like kings, asking for whatever they want. From food, from foods, from the fruits, the foods and the drinks, subhanAllah. They will request whatever they want from foods, fruits, and drinks, and shall be granted their wishes and desires. Subhanallah. Allah says in the Quran, Allah will say to them, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِهِ أَنفُسُكُمْ That for you, for you is whatever your heart's desire. What does that mean? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam explained that. What is Allah saying to them? You will get what your heart desires. What your heart desire. It means that first of all, in any person, a desire and comes in the heart before the words can be expressed on the tongue. Isn't that so? You are feeling for something, but that comes first in the heart and then you say it with the tongue. So the Prophet ﷺ says, just the desire will enter the heart, the person will not have the chance to utter what he wants and it's already in front of him. It's already in front of him. And that is what Allah says, you will get what your hearts desire. Just the desire will come in the heart and that will be provided there. We stop there, inshallah, we'll continue next day. كل يوم على بعضها ليه دنيا الناس بتنسى